What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. Why do I think this victim mentality has become so popular? Because I think we have leaders in this nation and who understand the value and the power of controlling people. And the best way to control people is to make them think that they're victims and to make them angry at their abusers and to not tell them that forgiveness is freedom and to not educate them in what real power is. Real power really is found at the foot of the cross in confronting all of your brokenness with Jesus Christ and knowing that you can do all things through him who strengthens you. We have leaders who don't want us to know that. Becoming a victim of injustice is beyond one's control, but developing a victim mindset is not. What does it look like to choose to be a victor instead of a victim? How can a victim overcome the pain, fear, and brokenness caused by trauma and lead a happy and fulfilled life? Our guest on this week's episode is Cynthia Garrett. She's an author, producer, evangelist, and the first African-American woman to host a major network's late-night TV show. In this episode, you will hear about Cynthia's journey through sexual abuse, social injustice, and pursuing a career as an African-American female in television industry. You will find out why she decided to face her brokenness and how you can choose victory over victimization. I'm your host, Helen Todd, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Good morning, Cynthia. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, and it's nice to be with you. (laughs) So I read your biography, and uh, wow, what an interesting and accomplished person you are. And it seems like as I'm looking at your story, it's like you have a calling of breaking the mold. Would you agree? (laughs) That is really good. That is a really good way of putting it. Yeah, I do agree. I feel like I've always tried to live my life outside of the boxes that people want to place you in because people want to place you in boxes so that they can get their mind around a person or a thing. You know, most people don't live in a box. And neither does God. And wouldn't you say that we also try to put God in a box? And that's what creates a very limited and narrow understanding of who God is. So true, Helen. So true. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the reason people put try to put God in a box all the time is because of their own lack of faith, their own inability to perceive that God can do it. God has done it. And God will do it again, whatever it is in their lives, you know, and in the world. And that's what really creates, you know, we create our own problems, (laughs) if you will. And what I love about your story is something that is relevant to every one of us is that it is so easy to fall into this trap of the victim culture that our society has embraced right now. In fact, I think it's literally the trademark of our times. And yet it is so dangerous for our happiness, for our future. And so your story is a wonderful example how in spite of who you are and what kind of circumstances you face, you don't have to be a victim. And the victory is really a choice. So you are the first African-American woman to become the host of a major network's late night talk show. I'm sure it wasn't an easy journey. How did that come about? Well, you know, it, it was kind of born of my own 
dream. I, I mean, I it was something I wanted. I knew that I wanted to have a late night show. I always loved interviewing people from the time I was young. I dreamt of working on television in that way. And I walked into my agent's office two years prior to getting that show. And I said, this is what I'd like to do. And I, I'd like to have, you know, have a late night show. And he said, okay, well, I'm not sure where that is, you know, how that comes about, but all things are possible. And within a year, I had the show that I wanted. So, you know, on NBC, I went in and I tested for a couple of shows. Uh, at the time I got the program, NBC was doing a lot of guest hosts and the show was sort of, uh, it was originally created for Bob Costas and then Greg Kinnear took it over and then Greg left to go on to a movie career. And in all honesty, I, the show was kind of doing nothing. And I went in to do a couple of guest shots and I ended up breaking 10 ratings and the network couldn't believe it. And they gave me the show <laughs> and I took it over about three weeks after my second appearance. So that was kind of easy. That was the easy part. Well, yeah, getting it was easy. Getting my career started was difficult. At the time, I was working for VH1 when I was given later. And that was born of years of, honestly, years of my own internal growth. You know, God was working on me. And then when I went to work pursuing my career, I had gotten saved. I was working hard trying to interview anybody I knew, trying to sit down and get myself on camera, trying to put together anything that would showcase what I could do. And I just went for it, you know? And then from that, from some tape that I made, I ended up getting an agent, you know, I signed with an agent. It, that was a complete God story as well. And uh, it was that agent who called me one day and he said, Never does someone walk in my office with a dream and I have the I have the joy to call them and say, you got exactly what you wanted, but NBC just offered to give you later full time. And so I ended up leaving VH1 and went and they, NBC relaunched the show and branded it as Later with Cynthia Garrett. Well, this sounds like a totally God story. So you mentioned that you became saved somewhere along the way as you were launching your career. How did that happen? Well, no, I got saved before I went into my career. It's too long a story, my testimony for a half an hour radio show, but I write about it in my first book, Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity, which is available on Amazon. Prodigal Daughter is really about my sort of uh, implosion at a certain point in my young life, in my early 20s, from just the sexual abuse and brokenness a rape as a teenager that had really kind of left me in a very scattered place looking for myself in relationships, in, you know, the wrong people and in the wrong behavior. And what I ended up finding as I landed, you know, across the country uh, or across the world in Europe, in Italy, in a nightmare of an experience married to an abusive man and testifying to get out of a mess and to save my own life. I met Jesus, you know, in a prison cell in Italy. It was a powerful meeting. It was a powerful, it's a powerful story. And uh, I had such a personal radical encounter with Christ that you could tell me that the, that it was nighttime and, and I would believe it if it was dark out. You could tell me that, you know, Jesus didn't exist and I would never believe it, no matter how much proof you thought you had. I know that I know that I know that God is real. And I know that Jesus saved me. Wow, that is incredible. So that was early on in your career then. Yeah, it was. It was very early on. Yeah. So you have experienced sexual abuse in your early life. You, uh, I'm sure, have faced challenges within your career as a woman, as an African-American. So were there situations where you felt like, you were victimized. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I often say I, I, I could be the poster child for every victim's group that's out there. I mean, I was sexually abused as a little girl by a relative in my own home. I was raped as a teenager. I had an abusive first marriage and 
annulment, divorce, whatever you want to call it, it, because I was pregnant longer than I was married. I was a single mom for quite a few years. You know, I got sexually harassed or marginalized or abused for being an African-American woman in my, you know, in the industry, in the entertainment industry for years. There, there, there are a million and one places where I could stop and, and just stand on, I've been a victim and life hasn't been easy and I don't want to continue and it's everybody's fault and blame, 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 victim, victim, victim. But for Pete's sake, you know, what on earth would that do? I couldn't agree more with you, you know, but but it's easier said than done because each one of these uh, things that you're describing, it's an extremely, it's emotional hurt. It affects your self-esteem. It affects uh, your understanding of who you are. So it's easy to say, you know, I I won't be a victim, but how do you deal with the pain and the hurt that this injustice causes? You have to confront your brokenness. And, you know, I often say the reality is that, you know, most people don't want to be victims. It's just that they don't know how to be a victor. They don't know how to choose victory. So honestly, for me, it was about learning to confront my victimization head on, you know, looking at it and going, okay, I'm broken. I have childhood brokenness and that most childhood brokenness stems from some sort of trauma that occurred when you were young. For me, it was pretty easy. Mine all went back to my childhood sexual abuse. And from there, you know, that's where I broke. That's where pieces of my emotional psyche, my spirit, my heart, my soul broke. And I developed because of that brokenness, anger, fear, uh, low self-esteem, shame, I mean, guilt, you, you know, you put it all together. And what happens as you get older is you start carrying those broken pieces of your emotions into your relationships with other people and into your behavior. And your brokenness is driving the car instead of your whole healed God created self. And so for me, I mean, it would it was years before I really dealt with my brokenness. What was the turning point? What would you say? Was there a specific event or a person that that became like, okay, this has got to stop? Yes, my son, my child. My son was about 13 or 14 years old, many years after I was saved and had given birth. And I realized that Whatever I was still struggling with, even though I had the career that I thought I wanted that would make me happy, I had everything that I thought would make me happy, I still struggled internally with many things. I would wake up and call it a bad mood. I you know, would escalate from zero to 100 with my emotions. And I knew that I was not really the one in control. you know. And, and I knew it didn't line up with what God says. You know, the Lord promises to give you an, uh, you know, an abundantly happy life. He promises peace that surpasses understanding. He promises joy, you know, and I didn't feel those things. And I knew that there was something disconnecting. And at that point, I had met the man who would become my husband. And he looked at me one day when I said to him, I don't get it. I'm a good Christian. I go to church every week. Why do I still feel like I'm struggling internally? And he looked at me and he said, because you have brokenness that needs to be confronted. And the the greatest reason for you to confront it is your son, because if you don't heal it and shut these doors that have been opened by the enemy into your life, he's going to take rights to accessing your son and attacking your son. And sure enough, I dove into my inner healing. And as I was healed, my son was healed on some incredible levels, in some incredible ways. And we shut doors in our home and I was able to get married healthily, understanding what marriage was and is to me. And it changed my life completely. So it's, and I talk a lot about this in Prodigal Daughter, my first book. You've got to confront your your brokenness. There's a whole chapter on it in Prodigal Daughter. So would you say that your brokenness you realized that your brokenness was starting to affect your son and impact him in some ways? Sure, because my emotions were all over the place. (laughs) 
You know, they were all over the place. And, and I knew that it wasn't healthy. And I knew that there was something wrong. And I knew that, you know, as I got in inner healing, I knew that uh, spiritually, this is very Bible based and scriptural, you know, when you, when you understand it, I knew that, for example, if I used alcohol or pot to numb my pain, I knew that I was opening portals to my child for the enemy to attack him. Absolutely. And I needed to close those doors and take authority over what was wrong. So what were some practical steps that you made to pursue this inner healing and and get out of the victim mentality? It was surrendering my life to Jesus Christ and accepting Jesus as Lord of my life, meaning his word, his, his way. You know, it's a death to yourself. You know, you've got to take all that stuff all that victim mentality, and you have to give it to the Lord and say, okay, I trust you. Where do we start? What's the way out? And you've got to confront your own brokenness. Were there people in your life? I know your husband was the one who initiated that process and told you that you have to confront that. Was it him or maybe some other people that came along the way to help you in that? My husband was critical to it because my husband had been involved in this kind of inner healing for about 10 years when he and I met. And so he understood it. And my husband is very mature spiritually in the Lord and in the word. So he understood scripturally what brokenness and inner healing was. And he was the one who led me through the journey. This uh, victim culture, victimization culture is very popular today on many levels, you know, among different segments of population. Why, why do you think it has become so popular? Why do I think this victim mentality has become so popular? Because I think we have leaders in this nation and who understand the value and the power of controlling people. And the best way to control people is to make them think that they're victims and to make them angry at their abusers and to not tell them that forgiveness is freedom and to not educate them in what real power is. Real power really is found at the foot of the cross in confronting all of your brokenness with Jesus Christ and knowing that you can do all things through him who strengthens you. We have leaders who don't want us to know that because if we don't know that, we look at each other for restitution. We look at each other with our anger and our blame and our entitlements. And we stay stuck. We say stay stuck in a victim's mentality. That's an excellent point. And uh, I'm very much in agreement with you on this. So you mentioned a very important word there, forgiveness. And so how, you know, and I think that's one of the difficult aspects of getting out of victim mentality is because that we know we have been wronged, that that we received the treatment that we did not deserve. And so we cannot step out of that without having, I, I don't think we can at least, without having forgiven the person that has wronged us. And, and that's, that's a big step. So how, how did you deal with that? Okay. So here's the thing. Forgiveness is the key. Jesus Christ's entire gig and his whole reason for coming here is about forgiveness. If we don't forgive others, we're basically saying that Jesus's, you know, whole thing it means nothing. I think that it, it, people don't understand what forgiveness is, and that's the problem. And so when you understand that forgiveness doesn't mean that the other person did you, you know, forgiveness doesn't mean the other person was right. It doesn't mean that you let the other person off the hook. Forgiveness is for you. It's for you to take the anchor and weight that the other person has put on your life and give them to God. You know, it's saying, God, this person did something horrible. They don't deserve my forgiveness, but you sent your son to die so that I would be forgiven for my sin. And every day I have sin. So I want to give this person to you and you give them to God. 
you give your right to judge to God. That's really what it's about. You know, you give your right to God to judge. It's hard to think about the atrocious things that people do for a lot of people and to think, oh my gosh, I have to forgive this person. But you're not cutting that person off the hook. You're cutting yourself off the hook that they put you on. And it's a very deep spiritual key to turn someone over to the Lord, to judge them. And once you do, that's where you find your freedom from being a victim. That's where you find your power. They no longer are able to reign over you emotionally because you've unlocked God's ability to go to work in your life and in their life. And it doesn't mean that the person that harmed you is ever going to call and apologize. It doesn't mean that they're ever going to admit that they did wrong. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. It's all about you. Absolutely. Have you had a chance to tell the person that wronged you, I forgive you? No, because the person that wronged me will never admit that he did it. He doesn't want to admit it. And when confronted with it by one of my brothers two years ago, which would be 20 years after the fact, 30 years after the fact, 40 years after the fact, whatever it is, his reply was, oh, I thought, I mean, why are we talking about that? I, I, I mean, I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought we were cool on that. She's never said anything, so. So I'm sure that made it that much harder for you to forgive if the person is not even willing to acknowledge that anything wrong has been done. But I agree with you. You can't break out of the victim mentality and the victim culture without forgiveness is the key foundation. And I think the other step is trusting God that even though these tragic events did happen in your life, that he has something great for you ahead. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The plans that God has for your life are incredible if you allow him to take over. And most people are just afraid to allow him to take over. You know, they think that surrendering to, you know, God and accepting Jesus Christ as their savior means that their whole life is going to, you know, be not fun and that they're, you know, guided by a set of rules and, They're not, you know, they're not. God has a great plan for all of our lives. It's just whether or not we accept it. And again, you know, if we only think of our future in terms of the box that we were put in by the circumstances, we can never break outside of that box. And God does not want us to be in a box. So, you know, your your life is a great example that when you're not willing to live in that victim mentality, the sky is the limit. You know, (laughs) you have had a wonderful and successful career. You have become a spiritual mentor for many people. In fact, more recently, you have become the executive producer for um, Darren Wilson's upcoming film, The God Man. Can you share? I know that it's still in the works, but can you share a little bit about this project? Yeah. Darren and I wanted to make a film that we could give to the world that would essentially be the 2021 contemporized version of the Jesus film. God, man is about Jesus. And it asked the question, who is Jesus today to people all over the world? You know, uh, we went down to the site of the George Floyd killing and asked the question. We go to the remotest parts of Alaska to ask this question. We go all over the world to ask this question, you know, to scholars, to normal people, to people who've been victimized, who've chosen to overcome. Who is Jesus? Who's the God man today? He's still the most important conversation that the world will ever have, no matter how much the world tries to escape it. Well, I love that you called it the contemporary version of the Jesus film. As a leader of a missions organization, I know how how wonderful is Jesus' film as an evangelistic tool. So who knows? Maybe the God-man will become the next evangelistic tool on the mission field and we'll be distributing it to people all over the world just for them uh, to answer the question for themselves who Jesus is. So I'm very much looking forward to this movie coming out. Well, um, you have used your pain and experience 
to help others and you're mentoring people, you know, who are going through similar situations. You even host a, a program uh, called Girl Talk. Am I correct? Girl Club. Girl Club is myself and three other powerful women of God of different ages. Uh, we have someone in their late 20s, in their 30s, and in their 40s, and myself, my 50s. And it's, we are real girls having real talk about real issues and applying our real faith. And Girl Club is for everybody, not just girls, but men have been tuning in as well. We film and air live every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 a.m. if you're Central Time, and 12 noon if you're on the East Coast. And we go out on a lot of platforms. We're on all the Salem media platforms, Light Source, One Place. But you can find us and subscribe at the Cynthia Garrett Ministries YouTube channel. And on my ministry YouTube channel, you can go back and catch up on all the girl clubs from the past. And you can see my TBN show, the sessions is there and lots of my preaching, you know, and sermons from around the world and just kind of keep up on all things video visual, Cynthia Garrett Ministries. But uh, girl club, I love because I wanted to get girls of all ages and I, that I knew and know are powerful warriors for Christ. They carry a powerful anointing in them to share the gospel and they're transparent and they're real. And so we share our own journeys and our own brokenness and our own struggles and pains. And, and when we're teaching on forgiveness, we're forgiving also. You know, when we're teaching on identity, we're growing our own identity as well. When we're sharing, right now we're talking about being single and dating and sex and the church and how the church doesn't help singles navigate their way to finding the right spouses. You know, we we kind of hit it all. You know, we hit it all. And um, I'm really excited and proud of uh, this series because I I'm... My TBN series is more about teaching and it's wonderful. And I have so many wonderful men and women leaders on. Um, but Girl Club is is about, it's a little bit more about us real girls, real regular girls. Well, my understanding is it not it is not just for girls because uh, you have some guys tuning in too who want to hear what you have to say or maybe understand better what women want. That's the key question, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to post uh, the link uh, to this program in the show notes for those who want to tune in. I think it's a great way to spend a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. And in the meantime, I just want to say thank you to you, Cynthia, for um, coming uh, on Limitless Spirit podcast and talking about um, such an important uh, topic. Oh, thank you, Helen. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm honored that you, you find my story worth sharing, you know, thank you. And, and I, I love the Lord, you know, and, and I love, I love that you're helping people to grow in their relationship with him. And thank you for having me. Cynthia's choice to confront her brokenness and focus on the healing is truly inspiring. It is an important lesson. Real power is found at the foot of the cross in confronting your brokenness with Jesus and knowing that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I admire so much the fact that Cynthia draws from her experience to mentor women in her program, Girl Club. I encourage you to check it out. You will find the link to it in our show notes. At World Missions Alliance, we believe that changed lives change lives, and finding healing through Jesus allows us to help others and lead others to Christ. So if you feel specifically called to missions, we would love to hear from you. I encourage you to visit our website, rfwma.org, and find out more information, how you can get involved and how you can fulfill the Great Commission. Thank you so much for listening to uh, this episode of the Limitless Spirit podcast. I would love to hear from you and your thoughts on this episode. You can email me at podcast at 
rfwma.org. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.